Um, good morning and welcome to our last day of uh, Bergen Exchanges. Uh, my name is Anna and I have the honor to introduce, uh, to introduce our um, last uh, keynote, today's keynote. And uh, it will be held by uh, Dr. Swati Shah, and, uh, who is a queer feminist anthropologist and works, with, uh, works on questions of uh, sexuality, gender, migration, and caste capitalism on, in India. Um, Svati holds uh, adjunct appointments in the Department of Anthropology and Afro-American Studies at University of Massachusetts at uh, Amherst and uh, uh, is currently working uh, on research on the rise of authoritarianism and the histories of the new left social movements, queer feminist critique and anthropology in South Asia. So. It's my honor to introduce uh, yeah, this keynote that will um, be, be such an important contribution to our last day here. Welcome, and I'm looking forward. to move the mug. Okay, good morning, everyone. Oh, it's a lot of lights up here. Um, so happy to be uh, with you and to have the honor of presenting the final keynote of Bergen Exchanges. Thank you so much, all of you, for the incredible week and welcome, and especially Siri, our fearless leader and spiritual guide uh, this week. I had no idea what Bergen Exchanges was at the beginning of the week, and I sh sure do now. Um, so it's just been incredible. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> in the interest of time, I'm just going to jump right in. Um, I am presenting from uh, a new body of work that I'm uh, kind of been doing for about eight years in India. Um, because the Indian political landscape has changed so much in that time as it has indeed everywhere, um, including of course <clears throat> the pandemic that we all experienced. Um, where I've come to now is um, really with a, a kind of focus and, and kind of an urgent interest in thinking about the ways in which autocracy is waged by a right-wing nativist populisms worldwide with a focus on India. One thing that I'm sure we can agree all nativist populisms share is their claim to revive a set of lost national traditions when in fact they are producing something new. A new consolidation of racialized or casted elites that somehow manages to subsume any potential concerns about increasing economic privation in an appeal to an extremely hierarchized form of heteropatriarchal religiosity. At the same time, they normalize anti-democratic forms of governance. In other words, I'm asking why oligarchy, which is one of the things that we're all really talking about, requires all these forms of heteronormativity and how that can feel like a confusing question to answer and ask in the Indian context in the wake of the ostensibly progressive anti-sodomy judgment in 2018. Here, what I'm gonna begin to suggest in the time that I have is that one way to unravel this is by looking at the history of land tenure systems in South Asia and what social forms they erased in the process of being realized. Because this view of a pure national tradition and culture that I re just referred to relies on normative, and I mean normative here in the Foucauldian sense of the valorization of a standard rather than the norm as rule. Because this traditional culture relies on normative sexuality and binary gender, and because a discursive location of this pure culture in the contemporary Indian context is often in an idealized notion of the village, I want to think here about the ways that we could think about the regularization of land tenure systems in the 18th century, for example, as a mechanism for reducing and controlling 
the diverse and multiple forms of sex, desire, and gender expression that continue to proliferate for producing normative sexuality and gender in the context of, relatively speaking, an anarchically queer countryside. So I'll just give the, the, the conclusion or the punchline right at the beginning where, where, where I'm going with this. What I'm trying to do is put sexuality and gender together as iterative processes, not as fixed topologies of the body with the historical, with the historical production of the rural as an economic space in order to think of the rural as invented via the topologies of racial and caste capitalism and the endogamous modes of heteronormativity that they require. This means acknowledging that this is where the resources that sustained the British Empire were initially drawn. The rural was the site of resource extraction in South Asia, which meant that it had to be invented topologically via instituting cash cropping and settled agriculture in key regions, which meant it also had to be regularized socially via systems of heritability and land use that had to be rendered through a patrilineal straightened, meaning heterosexualized, and straightened, meaning impoverished peasantry. All this had to be done in the face of largely peripatetic social worlds that British administrators, excuse me, I'm having some trouble with my computer, themselves described as chaotic and anarchic. The present day assertion on the part of forces like those of the Hindu nationalists who are now running India, that the countryside is a space of true indigeneity with a concomitant and perpetual social conservatism implies that it was beyond the reach of British colonial power rather than having actually been constituted by it, albeit in the face of great resistance and with highly uneven results. Much of the particulars of this is beyond the scope of this talk, but one thing I do want to emphasize here is the ways in which the Indian countryside was regularized, has had significant consequences for contemporary questions of administrative legibility, especially for those whose familial networks do not conform to the biologized patrilineal social form, as evidenced, for example, in the administrative mayhem being produced by the regime of compulsory biometric identification known as the Aadhaar card. And I absolutely will not have time to talk about that today, but I'm thinking about things here like residency requirements that getting this card requires, um, the ways in which these requirements instantiate patrilineality as evidenced by the many, many people who don't have access to Aadhaar and to the wider regime of administrative legibility that it connotes because they, they don't have a normative families, they don't have fathers or access to uh, patrilineal-esque documents or they just don't conform to the heteronorm. In his late 1980s essay, Capitalism and Gay Identity, American queer historian John D'Amelio argued that cities like New York and San Francisco offered the possibility of consolidating gay identity in the early 20th century because they provided spaces of economic autonomy for young men away from the prying eyes and familial economic webs of rural American agrarian society. He argued that the call of the factory and access to wage labor created space for queer sex and community and for the conditions necessary for seeding gay identity and culture. D'Amelio thus attached urban cosmopolitanism to gay identity via the changing organization of economic production in the post-war US. The conflation of queerness and the city and the concomitant idea of a rural heteronormative countryside was accomplished by establishing a twin telos of development from queer sexual practices to gay identity and from agricultural labor to formal sector employment in urban factories. It was the raw and the cooked, so to speak, a substrate of same sex sexual practices and affinities that eventually migrated into urban queer cosmopolitan identity. This persists as a remarkably stable, spatialized narrative for sexuality politics, despite much empirical evidence to the contrary, especially from the global South. I'm thinking here about the proliferation of work on the many worlds and forms of sexual desire, affinity, and gender expression throughout history, worlds which were not necessarily articulated by identity, nor rendered by a modern frames of gender or sexuality. In the great agrarian conquest, 
economic historian Niladri Bhattacharya addresses the question of enclosure and dispossession in colonial Punjab in northern India by showing how agrarianism became the universal form and telos for the Indian rural under the British and the ways this sustained a similarly universalized idea of caste endogamy based in settled peasant society. He writes, quote, by mapping villages over the entire landscape, the British displaced alternative forms of habitation and livelihood, unquote. This was dispossession by cadastral imaginary that itself was imperfect and yet also became the basis for a near constant assertion from both the left and the right that sexual non-normativity, be it sex work or queerness, is not real India meaning that it is not present in rural areas because naturalized normative sexuality has always reigned there, much like nature itself. Patachadia's work recalls Raymond Williams's foundational text, The Country and the City, in which Williams introduces us to Arthur Young, a failed 18th century English farmer and author of The Annals of Agriculture, a book that advanced Ricardian notions of the non-urban as a space that should be converted into the engine of economic growth. In the Great Agrarian Conquest, Patacharya shows us evidence of Young's obsession with eliminating newly defined fallow wastelands in the Indian countryside. Quote, keen to convert all rural spaces into productive landscapes, colonial officials idealized an image of the peasants of central Punjab as a hardy lot, busy cultivating their own farms. Settled agriculture was valorized as normative and desirable. When fixed to a piece of land, peasants became knowable and controllable. Their lands could be surveyed, assessed, and taxed. Pastoralists were often more difficult to control, govern, and extract revenue from, so they had to be settled, fixed to the land, bounded within delimited spaces, and turned into fiscal subjects of the state. Constituting rural spaces as villages was one way of creating such landscapes of settled agriculture." Unquote. Patacharya goes on to say that this included, quote, mapped villages onto the landscape, even when there were none. It is remarkable to think of village India as literally imagined into cadastral reality, especially when, as Williams writes, this new geography constitute, was constituted by a, quote, an abstraction from the social relationships through which the new methods worked. Patacharya calls what happened, quote, the conquest of an entire rural universe, a conquest in the strongest sense of the term to visualize a rural as agrarian and to imagine the village as the universal sign of the rural can only be through a process of massive erasure, a refusal to see the legitimacy of other spaces, other habitations, unquote. In this, he includes practices of inheritance, rules of adoption and gift, and notions of patrilineal and primogeniture that were consistently reformulated and respecified through lit litigation. A queer and gender non-binary reading of this would also include habitations and social practices that do not conform to binary gender and sexuality, that do not conflate sexuality with heterosexual social reproduction, and do not naturalize the nuclear or patrilineal joint family ruled by fathers and brothers. I in no way mean to reduce the social conquest of the rural to a hunt for revenue alone, but it does seem relevant to ask whether if this mapping of the rural including the mapping of social forms as a means to extract revenue, means that the history of heterosexuality itself is also the history of enclosure. At the very least, I think we can ask whether the informal can be defended as a space of possibility for survival, as well as non-heteronormative arrangements that may look like many things, including but not limited to modernist cosmopolitan homonormativity. This possibility is embedded in the construction of the rural itself, in which in India, the new 19th century codes of inheritance, adoption, patriline, and primogeniture were constantly being subverted, a non-urban legacy that is perhaps worth tracing into the present. Whereas section 377, which is India's colonial era anti-sodomy law that was overturned in 2018, whereas this law is seen today as an anti-homosexuality law and sometimes more broadly as an anti-LGBTQ law, it was surely neither of these things in the mid to late 19th century when the Indian Penal Code was being drafted, debated, and revised. Then as now, 
the array of laws governing sex and marriage were part of a wider context in which social norms were being instantiated. Rather than mapping 377 backward in time via the presentist lens of state homophobia or the presentist narrative of timeless queer and gender diverse Hindu acceptance, historiographical readings of 377 emphasize the broad definition of the phrase unnatural offenses in the language of the law and the ways in which this overtly implied everything from non-reproductive sex between cis men and women to same-sex sex to adultery as per South African historian Tato Magano's critique on 18th century Dutch colonial discourses of sodomy as catechistic. The ways in which homosexuality, quote unquote, emerged from this milieu as a biologized social type in the West is the stuff of sexuality studies syllabi around the world taught by a Foucauldian reading of the church confessional that often sidesteps the question of racialization and caste formation. However, in India, as Janaki Nair and Mary John pointed out as early as 1998, quote, it was not the confessional couch or the hystericized woman that generated knowledge and anxieties about sexuality in modern India, so much as on the one hand, the administrative urgency of the colonial power to make sense of and thereby govern a baffling array of types and classes and their family systems, and on the other, the nationalist need to define the dutiful place of the citizen subjects of the incipient nation." Unquote. Of this baffling array of family systems, they wrote that, quote, older as well as more recent scholarship has tended to focus on the material structures of which these sexual arrangements were a part, rather than the shifts in female subjectivities that were enabled by the agencies of change in the 19th century, a period when families and marriages were being formed and reformed, unquote. If the material structures of which sexual arrangements like marriage were a part included Section 377 as part of a broader effort to control marriage and sex by, newly established, by the newly established British Raj in, the 18, in 1860, then 377 was also a way to articulate caste-based endogamy and the relations of production toward a stable topologized order that facilitated resource extraction and rent seeking. Acknowledging the diversity of form and practice is important in complicating the history of what we see as rural space in general, and certainly in India. I'm referencing here both the actual diffusion of productive and non-productive geographies and social arrangements that exist in non-urban spaces, as well as problematizing the idea that non-urban India has always consisted of a knowable and uniform set of agrarian villages that serve as sources of urban labor migration and as sites of economic struggle and impoverishment. This ideal of the rural is important to Hindu nationalist imaginaries today, but it, is also important, it has also been important to Indian nationalism, um, and I would extend this claim as far as the earliest 20th, early 20th century anti-colonial struggles for independence. Gandhianism, for example, asserted that real India was the India of the village, and that the village, whatever image that conjured, was a knowable and ubiquitous entity. This ideal was a powerful tool in consolidating the idea of India as it were, and it remains so. Perhaps, to use Williams's term, the ideal of rural heteronormativity in India is itself an eclogue, a pastoral poem about that which was lost, a bucolic ideal that never was, what it actually was and is, is at the heart of prevailing debates on sexuality and gender identity, wherein the idea of India is again so highly contested. In framing sexuality and the political economy of land tenure systems together here, we find ourselves assessing how the former becomes a trope of radical individualism, while being so fundamentally iterative of the racialized categories of caste and of the modes of production that distribute land, legibility, and survival. All the while, gender and sexuality norms are constantly broken and reassembled, and non-heteronormative others continue to wage life and survival. I have a few more minutes um, beyond what I uh, had planned to say. So I will say a couple of things about why this is not um, as confusing as it might seem in the contemporary moment, because um, 
you know, the Indian state is very good at PR. This Indian state is very good at PR. I'm not sure what else it's good at, but it's very good at PR. So one of the things that um, we all know about India is that in 2018, uh, it became one of the first uh, former British colonies to overturn this um, colonial era anti-sodomy law. This had a kind of twin um, effect. One of the things that this does in India is it sort of um, elides and erases the importance of British colonialism and replaces this with um, a notion of the Mughal Empire as an invading force. So when this Indian state talks about colonialism and colonial invaders, they are using it to mobilize um, a, a wide swath of anti-minority sentiment specifically targeting Muslim communities. So it's sort of, it's not kind of directing, it's not a, a way of directing state homophobia at queer people. It's a way of locating homophobia in the idea of a, a kind of retrograde um, Muslim invasion of an otherwise stable Hindu public that existed for all time. And um, our friends in religious studies would be, will be horrified by that because of the various histories of so-called Hinduism and Vedic religion in South Asia, which are very complicated and which clearly show that there is not one unitary Hinduism as far as, as, as we experience it today. The other thing that this does is it narrows the um, ways in which queer movements, and by that I don't just mean queer people who advocated for queer rights, I mean people who were part of the queer movement, which was a broad swath of people from Indian civil society and very much part of the larger democratic rights movements in India. The ways in which since the early 90s, those people um, have been arguing for a very broad way of um, claiming privacy rights through um, provisions like Article 21 of the Indian Constitution, which is the right to life, which has been um, talked about here by Namita and some others over the course of this week. That claim to privacy um, was not something that uh, queer ad advocates uh, had much choice about. There are international precedents that attach um, queer rights to privacy um, in the US context, in the British context, and as any good lawyer will tell you, you have to build on the precedents that precede you. So um, what uh, very uh, amazing and brilliant uh, legal advocates in India did was they had an expanded view of privacy to include bodily autonomy. So in taking great pains not to conflate queerness with bourgeois urban subjectivity, they um, included um, uh, petitioners in the various challenges to 377 who were um, hijra sex workers who had been assaulted in police stations and argued that that was a violation of their privacy rights. By 2018, the, the Hindu nationalist Indian government saw an opportunity to um, really capitalize again, this PR thing to really capitalize on overturning sodomy, which by then almost, almost felt like an, a foregone conclusion. It wasn't inevitable by any means. There were significant setbacks along the way, particularly around 2013, 14, but overall it did seem that this was going to happen. But by the time they overturned um, the provision within 377 that uh, criminalized homosexuality, they did so via a much more narrow and liberalized reading of um, privacy rights. So by 2018, privacy rights is the rights that you have to privacy within the four walls of your home. It is not, it is no longer bodily autonomy. One of the consequences of this, as we see in many uh, kind of queer uh, political spaces around the world, is really a kind of a depoliticization, a de-radicalization of uh, the initial impetus to try to connect um, bodily autonomy and questions of sexuality and gender to questions of land rights. And we see this also in India in the ways in which uh, 377 is being used as a precedent for other things, um, like uh, some of the provisions around um, Aadhaar ostensibly, as well as um, a kind of 
erroneously as one of the rationales for the abrogation of Section 370, which uh, Angana Chatterjee was talking about yesterday. Okay, I think I'm actually out of time now, so I'm going to stop there, and I welcome your questions. Thank you. I'll just stay here. But I, I also realized that I didn't mention that this event, uh, such an inspiring talk, thank, thank you. you for that, for this contribution, is also, uh, no. <laughs> no, I can't. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I didn't mention that it was a, a collaboration between the Global Research Program on Inequality and the Center for Women's and Gender Research, and also a part of our Law Transform Queer Law Fair seminar series. So thank you for this contribution, and everybody knows what to do by now. <laughs> Looking forward to listen to your questions and your answers. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for a lucid and powerful and beautiful talk. Thank you, Angara. It was a treat to Thank be you. here. Thank you. Uh, this is not very well thought, and this may, it doesn't directly relate to what you spoke to, but what you something you alluded to. So may I? Um, so one of the things that I've been noticing and has been narrated to me by some women is that Hindu nationalist no, it's Sorry. okay. No, no, go ahead. Hindu nationalist policing and violence today are being mainstreamed as constitutive of rural gender relations between women. Like women are policing each other. Women are policing each other. Yes. As part of becoming part of that Hindu nationalist scape, yes. And that it is impacting what they had understood or experienced as non-heteronormative relations between them, or what would often be languished as homosocial relations between them. And what that is doing to both mainstreaming a kind of violent heterosexuality, I mean, I think heterosexuality is violent, period, but a different kind of nationalist heteropatriarchal sociality. And what does, what that, that does to women who don't necessarily identify as not straight, but the relations between them are fluid, right? Yes. And what that does to it. So I just wondered if you had some comments on that. Thank you. Well, yeah, we'll just... This is just too much, yes. Thank you so much. That was that was really fascinating. Thank you. Um, I speak out of ignorance, but curiosity. And I wanted to hear your reading of the NALSA decision in the third gender. Um, the rhetoric in that decision is heavily nationalistic too. Mm -hmm. But since these uh, traditional figures on which um, the possibility to, to recognize and relatively comparatively very early terms, the third gender, um, is in, in my understanding is not something, these figures like the Hijras are not just exclusive to the Hindu, but they also are in the, mis in the Muslim world. I wonder what your you know, reading of the national, I always thought this was uh, to the West. So this was some kind of homo <laughs> um, transnationalism in a way, but I wonder how that then speaks to this other form of nationalism that you were referring to. Thank you. Thanks, Swati. I really enjoyed that. Um, and I love the way in which you bring together otherwise kind of disparate kind of, um, you know, ways of looking at things, particularly in terms of bringing in the historical agrarian and, you know, linking it to the um, ways in which um, uh, heterosexuality and homosexuality and queerness is configured in, in, in the context of the law. So there's a lot of com complex things you're pulling together. So my, I, I actually wanted um, a little more kind of maybe um, differentiation in terms of where in India, because I think that India is so diverse. And I'm particularly coming from the context of 
So I'm thinking about sort of images of the peasantry and village, et cetera, as they were imagined, were dependent, um, as you say, um, on, and they were related to debates on sexuality and, and, and prevailing land tenure systems. I totally, uh, you know, I, I accept that and I think that's great, but it also depended, as I was saying, on where in British colonial India, and I'm coming from the context of feudal states like Rajasthan, who were, and there were several, and I was wondering whether Kashmir was probably also one of those, you know, so Hyderabad, Andhra Pradesh, et cetera, where the constitution and the social constitution and the land tenurial sort of, um, you know, relationships with the British were completely different. And in, especially in the context of Rajasthan, it was a, it's a very feudal and hyper-masculinized kind of context um, uh, throughout. And the British actually supported that, you know, the colonial engagement. So I was wondering whether then in that context, the ways sexuality then comes to, you know, sort of be, you know, both be imagined and experienced now is going to be so different from the rest of India, both in the urban and the rural context. And I'm also thinking of Eric Stokes work in Cambridge, who did this book called The Peasants and the Raj. And he talked about how in context like Rajasthan, there was a very different sort of circulation, which the British didn't have control over. So there was an inherent masculinity um, that, that existed there. So I just wanted to push a little bit on that, and I'd be really interested to hear about that. Thank you. Morning. Uh, so before I ask my question, I just want to point out one thing from the judgment itself. And I always teach this in my class also. So the judges, the majority judgment, uh, it actually went on to say that sexual orientation is one of the many biological phenomena, which is natural inherent, et cetera, et cetera. Any discrimination on the basis of one's sexual orientation would entail a violation of fundamental right or freedom of expression. And it also forms part of the judgment that they you know, gave categorically in the last paragraph. So it's an operative law you know, under Article 142. So what I mean to ask is that the judges, as you were very rightly pointing it out also, that the judges did not confine themselves to just you know, decriminalizing uh, 377, just, not just reading it down, but they went and built on NALSA of 2014 to sort of say that once we have recognized gender identity in NALSA, that means it becomes incumbent on us, especially after right to privacy judgment, that sexual identity is also inherent as part of right to life under Article 21. So they were not confining themselves to just, you know, the four walls privacy kind of a thing. But actually the narrative which went after the judgment was exactly that. And this is where my question is. So even in my university, it's a public university, Jawaharlal Nehru University, if anybody knows, uh, we had a very important mobilization at that time. And uh, it was like a huge thing, like everything is painted and everybody is on, you know, on the streets, they're rallying, everything. But now uh, when we meet on, in those clubs, the cause is sort of lost. And I was discussing this with you earlier also. So what is the one thing that we should you know, pick from this judgment because it is the law, it's the operative part. So what is that one thing that should now be you know, in the center stage of mobilizing that law? Is it going to be a broader sense of sexual autonomy? Is it going to be a freedom of expression thing? Or is it going to be same-sex marriage? Like, which is the one issue that should you know, hold back the whole movement together instead of you know, fragmenting it further? Thank you. Thank you, Swati. I love this. Uh, and I think it's so important to do these kind of, of, uh, of empirical studies in, in different contexts. And I think the, the article by John Demille on, on gay capitalism, um, on, yeah, and, uh, on capitalism and gay identity, I mean, it was so important in its time and, and just to deconstruct the notion of a, an essential, uh, to deconstruct the notion of, of a gay identity, but it also this article and a lot of the gay studies in its time 
created so many blind spots for everything that was going on outside. And uh, Norway was uh, a rural and uh, underdeveloped country for a long time. And, and uh, this is exactly what we are going to look at in our new project on Queerdom, to look at the uh, mechanisms in the rural areas uh, before this modern notion of, of gay identity came in in Norway, probably way after the Second World War. So yeah, I'd love to talk more about this later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tuna. Um, 10 minutes? Oh, great, okay. Um, I, I'll, I'll go backward. So I very much appreciate, uh, especially being in Norway, I very much appreciate that many of the critiques that uh, you know, somebody like myself would be making where I'm focusing on India and the idea of the global south. Um, it's important to remember that part of what we're all pushing back on is a very, um, I won't even say Euro-American, but a very, a, a very American um, bias within, um, particularly within gender and sexuality studies. And, um, and I don't just mean, um, you know, Americans are bad and inward looking and, um, you know, uh, ethnocentric, I mean um, the kind of historical reference within queer studies as it's developed within the US um, has very much focused on American historical narratives. So I really, much, I very much appreciate that um, those narratives don't work for most people um, and that they have to be specified in, in many, many different ways. Um, Namita, I, I absolutely am informed by this, um, the critiques that you mentioned. Um, I think um, it's not just an urban bias within development studies. I also think it's an urban bias within queer studies. And um, broadly speaking, what I'm trying to do, and maybe this is a way to connect your question with Maya's, is I'm trying to um, use the resources within anthropology that have not often been thought of as resources by scholars of gender and sexuality studies. And I'm specifically thinking about, you know, the, the, the tremendous amount of work within anthropology, which um, in, in a very problematic way, and yet, you know, it, it still brings out certain facts and certain stories in a very problematic way a lot of what anthropology did, especially in its early years, was talk about different forms of sociality, different kinds of sexual arrangements, different ways that people related to each other intimately. It didn't use that language. It didn't use the language of intimacy or even sex most of the time. Um, you know, talked about things like adolescence and you know, development and stuff like that. But it, it was about, you know, a kind of very normative Western gaze on these bizarre practices of these brown and black people. But the bizarre practices were all of these very different and, you know, these kind of arrangements around sexuality and homosociality um, that were defined as being backward and being you know, ag against the development paradigm. And I actually think that contemporary queer scholars can use those things as resources to undo this urban bias that we see in many different fields, including both development studies and queer studies. Um, Maya, um, absolutely, this is not a nearly sufficient treatment of the, the hundreds, if not thousands of different ways that land tenure systems need to be historicized and have been historicized in South Asia. So um, I'm, t I'm using uh, Neil Niladri Bhattacharya's book for this, excuse me, which means I'm thinking um, at this moment, I'm thinking with Punjab. Um, but I think uh, my bias in making this critique would be in, um, places where uh, pastoralism um, persisted uh, beyond uh, where it persisted in other places and places, um, kind of the place, kind of the work of Anand Yang also would be, I think, very important to think with for this. But um, I think this story would be very different in West Bengal. It would be very different in uh, the context of the Rayot Wari system. Um, being not a historian myself, I would be relying on secondary literature 
for some of these critiques, but I think that I would have a bias toward pastoralism, at, the, at least in the way that I'm thinking right now, and I would love to talk with you about that more. Um, Ruth and Bhavya, I'll uh, put your uh, questions together if that's all right. Uh, the 2018 judgment had a lot of uh, language that, um, and you and I could definitely argue about this, but um, in my reading, it had a lot of language that reified and reinstantiated the idea of liberal individualism in a way that had not been done by earlier iterations of um, queer advocacy in India. So um, to answer also Namita's question about what happened before the last eight years, so much happened before the last eight years. The very first challenge to 377 happened in the early 90s, and it was done by ABVA. It was um, led by Siddharth Gautam, um, who was a very important uh, historical figure within um, queer politics in India, uh, who died in the 90s, and uh, whose organization uh, was an HIV, an anti-HIV AIDS organization, and was part of the era of queer organizing that was easily and uh, without much provocation making connections amongst all communities that were affected by HIV AIDS. So that included uh, men who had sex with men, that included uh, queer people in general, it, it was in the context of the criminalization of homosexuality and in the context of the criminalization of sex work. So it was kind of making these broad um, alliances that would be difficult if not unthinkable today because the, the legal landscape has changed so much and in many ways has kind of broken some of those earlier alliances. So the first challenge happens in the early 90s, it fizzles out, and then the next wave of real challenges starts in 2001 with uh, the Nas Foundation in, in Delhi and Anjali Gopalan and the kind of, um, you know, even before Voices Against 377, which was um, consolidated later than that after, after 2001. So the, 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 the Nas petition, as it's known in 2001, um, talks about a private sphere, not a private space. By the time we get to 2018, we're seeing language in the judgment like expression of choice and inclination, natural variations of expression and free thinking process pertaining to individual di dignity and decisional autonomy. And, you know, who doesn't want individual dignity? Who doesn't want decisional autonomy? We all do. But in the context of a judgment like this, this locates sexuality in the body. It does not locate sexuality within a sphere of existence. It locates sexuality inside, in here somewhere, right? In my pituitary gland or something. So that kind of um, language is actually very, very important to unpick because it does produce sexuality within a, a context in, in which, you know, we can't talk about uh, structural politics anymore. We can't talk about land. Um, we can't talk about minority rights, really. We're just talking about kind of a chemical process almost. Um, this brings me to um, Asif and, and Ruth's uh, question. Um, Asif, wherever you are, I sort of hear you asking what is to be done. And um, let, let me start with what's not to be done. What's not to be done is what's happened uh, with, and I won't use the word trans here for this. Uh, there has been critique within the literature on mapping uh, the term trans or transgender onto non cis normative uh, spaces and people and communities in South Asia. But um, so I'll use a more hopefully descriptive term, non cis normative. But, one thing that has happened in the wake of the Nalsa judgment in India is um, the assertion of a, a kind of a, a right-wing Hindu nationalist third gender space that is um, being um, sort of advanced by um, people who were assigned male sex at birth and who in an earlier moment may have identified as Hijra but today identify as Kinnar because that's a more Sanskritized uh, term and it's a way of eliding and erasing 
any association that these communities had with uh, the with with syncretism, with any kind of religious syncretism, uh, with the Mughal Empire, with the kind of um, status that people had, uh, Hijraz had in the Mughal courts. Um, so it's part of a kind of wider uh, Hindutvavadi assertion that's happening within queer and non-cis normative spaces in India that uh, many people like myself find extremely troubling. And there are other people here like Jaina who's worked a lot more on Nalsa and who could speak about this in great, uh, in much more detail. But generally speaking, um, one, one thing I'm very troubled by is, is the kind of, uh, th these assertions coming from queer and non-cis normative spaces that, uh, that Hinduism is a is Hinduism as presented by the Hindu right is a positive force for sexuality politics in India, and in that way sustains the aims of the the current government. So to end with Asif's question, what is to be done? I I think we, I think queer and non cis normative movements in India have to make this point. We have to push back on this because these movements and spaces have their own radical history that I think we can access very productively. Thank you.